Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, dear panelists, the audience, and the organizing team. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to our expert panel discussion addressing the issue: Why are Indian parties not choosing Indian institutional arbitration to administer their disputes? I take this opportunity to introduce everyone with the organizers, Lex Witness, and Society of Corporate Legal Experts. Lex Witness is India's first magazine on legal and corporate affairs. For over ten years, since its inception in two thousand nine as a monthly magazine, Lex with Lex Witness has become India's most credible platform for the legal luminaries to opine, comment, and share their views. Society of uh, Corporate Legal Experts is an organization that aims to bring the fraternity members worldwide and the students of law and commercial disciplines to come together for sharing their thoughts on the commercial law policies and current trends in these laws. I now introduce everyone with our esteemed mod moderator, Mr. Chiranjeev Sabu. Mr. Sabu is a dispute lawyer with three years of practice. In these years, he has advised and represented, amongst the other, energy and resources, construction, infrastructure, ships, shipping, and trade trade companies, to name a few. In doing so, he has participated in arbitration, both ad hoc and institutional, for joint venture, shareholders, construction, and consortium disputes and related court proceedings. He also took part in emergency arbitration and early dismissal proceedings under the rules of CAC. and represented clients in high courts city civil courts consumer forums and trade trademark registry i now uh, request the attendees to place all their questions in the question and answer box visible on your respective dashboards you can upvote and comment on a question as well we will try and conduct a live uh, live question and answer round towards the end of the session you may uh, you may use the raise hand icon if you are interested to ask your questions live In the interest of time and more questions, we will prefer questions coming into the question and answer box. Please have a look at your chat box, where the webinar help desk will be posting updates regularly. I now request Mr. Sabu to take it from here. Thank you, Devita, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, Society for Corporate Legal Experts and Lex Witness for organizing this expert panel discussion. A very good afternoon to one and all. Welcome to today's session. uh today we have a very exciting panel for you joining us as a first speaker is ms jyoti dasidar ms dasidar is a partner at cyril amarchand mangaldas she has over 11 years of experience in commercial litigation arbitration and white collar crimes she is also an advocate and record of the supreme court of india and regularly represents clients in supreme court high court district court and various arbitrations thank you for joining us ms dasidar Uh, for our second speaker we have mr aditya jalan mr jalan is a partner at azbn partners he has over 10 years of experience in handling commercial disputes regulatory investigations international and domestic arbitrations and white collar crimes he regularly appears before the supreme court high court various tribunals and arbitrations thank you for joining us mr jalan as a third speaker we have mr sitesh mukherjee Mr Mukherjee headed the disputes practice at Trial Legal which he recently left to start his own independent practice. He has over 27 years of experience in conducting a variety of corporate commercial arbitrations as well as regulatory disputes in diverse industries such as energy, construction, infrastructure, banking, finance etc. He regularly appears before the Supreme Court, High Court, various tribunals and arbitrations. Thank you for joining us Mr Mukherjee. As a last speaker, we have Mr. Zameer Nathani. Mr. Nathani is senior vice president and general counsel for UFO Movies. He has over 18 years of experience in the legal fraternity, and in these years, he has worked as a law firm attorney for renowned and global corporates uh, such as Eureka Forbes, LG Electronics, TCL India, Ginger Hotels, Johnson and Johnson, and other MNCs from US, UK, Asia Pacific, etc. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Nathani. Uh, now before we begin let us first understand why we are here ineffective laws excessive judicial interference long delays high costs these are some of the trades by which india was known in respect to arbitration however india has come a long way from there india recognized the need for an efficient and an effective alternate dispute resolution system 
and through various amendments in the arbitration act and judicial decisions india made an attempt to solve this problem and create a robust arbitration friendly jurisdiction as a result it can be seen that arbitration has become the default mode of dispute resolution for commercial parties in india however in india arbitration is still synonymous with ad hoc arbitration most parties either deliberately or inadvertently choose ad hoc arbitration and when parties do choose institutional arbitration they flock to arbitration centers in singapore london paris or hong kong to settle their disputes therefore giving rise to this question why are indian parties not choosing indian arbitration institutions to administer their disputes with this backdrop and without further ado i'd like to invite ms dasida to share her views ma'am hello good evening uh, it's a pleasure to be here thank you so much uh, so the topic that i intend to cover is uh, institutional arbitration vis-a-vis -vis ad hoc arbitration uh, what are the benefits of institutional why is it that parties today still opt to go in for ad hoc arbitrations and not institutional arbitrations so i'll try and uh, it's a really broad spectrum uh, of issues to be covered and i'll try and give you a little flavor of everything so to begin with what is institutional arbitration and what is ad hoc arbitration institutional arbitration refers to administration of arbitration by an institution in terms of its own procedural laws uh, the institution will provide support uh, for the conduct of the arbitration proceedings whether uh, in the form of appointment of arbitrators uh, case management services you want venues they'll arrange for that as well as uh, you know scrutiny of the final award that is passed uh in ad hoc uh, arbitrations the administration is not carried out by an arbitral institution but the proceedings uh, will proceed under the supervision of the tribunal itself uh in india we see that the interest in uh, institutional arbitrations as chiranjeev just mentioned uh, is very lukewarm you know there are several uh, arbitral institutions as of uh, 2017 we know that there are more than 35 in india despite this it hasn't really taken off uh, there are several uh, domestic um, uh, institutions such as ica by fiki we have the delhi international arbitration center we have the mci in mumbai uh, obviously parties have access to the international one cai icc lcia there uh, we we are also aware of arbitration facilities that are provided by public sector undertakings whether you know it is the pma under the department of uh, public enterprises there are various trade and merchant associations there are city specific chambers uh, of commerce and industry such as asocham and bombay chambers uh, of commerce as well so these institutions provide a uh, varying degrees of administrative support for arbitrations they have their own sets of arbitral rules panels and so on uh, but despite the existence of these um, institutions in india we see that parties prefer ad hoc uh, and regularly approach the court for appointment of arbitral tribunals under uh, the arbitration and uh, conciliation act abroad however the reverse uh, is true uh, there was a study done by the queen mary university of london with price waterhouse coopers which showed that uh, 86% of private disputes were resolved through institutional arbitration and at least 67% of 67% uh, of disputes involving a state instrumentality or state owned enterprises were resolved through institutional arbitration in india it's not the case uh, why does this happen there are obviously a few obvious uh, advantages uh, ad hoc arbitrations uh, are suitable for all types of cases for all quantum uh, of matters uh, they are generally preferred where the amounts involved are small uh, parties also feel that they are in control of the proceedings they feel that they can control the timelines and it is relatively cost effective parties feel that they have to pay only uh, the tribunal their own counsel and uh, you know the venue and administ and minor administrative sort of charges uh, one does not have to pay uh, what is seen as uh, the typically exorbitant costs involved in institutional uh, admin fees uh, however the disadvantages of ad hoc arbitrations that we see far outweigh the perceived uh, benefits one of course since uh, the arbitration itself is adversarial if parties have not agreed on arbitration terms before the dispute arises 
they are unlikely to fully cooperate uh, the end, uh, you know, once a dispute has begun, there is unlikely to be any consensus. It will lead to further delays. Uh, second, even on the issue of appointment of arbitrators, parties generally rely on the uh, good sense of their counsel, on their advice. You want to identify neutral quality arbitrators. But as far as international arbitrations are concerned, parties may not be in a position, if they're not sophisticated parties, they may not be in a position to choose uh, an arbitrator that is technically very sound, if it is a, you know, if it is a technical arbitration, suppose oil and gas, or uh, the arbitrator should have specific uh, knowledge of law pertaining to say Quebec law, you know, so you need for a specific, a trained arbitrator qualified, uh, technically sound as well. So arbitral uh, institutions go a long way to assist you in this, uh, in uh, matters such as this. Uh, thirdly, um, the fees of arbitral tribunals are usually decided, at least in our ad hoc arbitrations, are decided in the first procedural hearings. We see that there is usually some awkwardness if uh, there is any disagreement between the parties or even, or even with the tribunal over interpretation of that first procedural order. Uh, you know, but arbitral institutions are, a, are an intermediary in this process. Uh, step in and you do not have to go through any of this awkwardness. It's, it, you know, it's actually, we've experienced something like this in the past. It is not anecdotal and you do not want to uh, be at odds with the tribunal because they are ultimately going to decide the matter. Also, um, in international arbitrations, we see that there is scope of misunderstandings between parties. Parties come from different nationalities. They're from different jurisdictions. There are cultural biases. There may be a lack of cultural understanding. This may lead to further delays. Uh, parties may not be conversant in certain languages. So all of this creeps in. So uh, in such cases, parties are usually amenable to a neutral party, uh, such as the secretariat of an institutional arbitration stepping in and sort of uh, administer, administering the process. Also, lastly, the cost savings that uh, parties uh, usually contemplate uh, will happen in an ad hoc uh, arbitration. Uh, we see if it's a recalcitrant party on the other side who constantly keeps going to court, you see that there is, uh, you know, in the ultimate analysis, there is no cost savings benefit at all. So uh, because of these benefits, uh, we strongly advise as, as a council myself, I would strongly recommend institutional arbitration. So quickly, I'll go through a few uh, advantages. Uh, why should we go in for an institutional arbitration? One, it is structured. It provides an institutional framework which is intended to provide uh, is intended to provide transparency, fairness, and efficiency in the resolution of disputes. It also allows parties um, autonomy to dis, uh, to exercise their choice over several aspects of procedure. There are clear and well defined rules of procedure. Uh, they provide the timelines, there is support of trained staff who will administer various stages of the proceedings, who will clarify doubts, who will step in, who will avert uh, deadlocks. Even the remuneration of the tribunal, which is something of, a, you know, can be difficult during ad hoc proceedings, you, it does not need the direct involvement of any of the parties. Also, there is constant monitoring of the arbitration itself. The, uh, the secretariat will ensure that there are no delays by any one party. Uh, the secretariat will step in to ensure that there are no unnecessary procedural hearings and that adjournments are kept to a minimum. You also have the intervention of a court. Here I'm looking specifically uh, at certain foreign institutional arbitration, arbitration institutions uh, such as ICC or CIAC, which will not just confirm, replace or appoint arbitrators, they'll monitor the process, they'll scrutinize the final award, uh, and so on. Also, uh, arbitral institutions regularly update their rules, they have a finger on the pulse, they uh, update the clause itself to reflect current business and commercial realities. Uh, also, certain arbitral um, institutions provide for a two-tier regime, so a dissatisfied party can actually appeal uh, and get uh, and get the um, institution to take a relook at the award in case there's an error and so on. 
I'm specifically talking of GAFTA or say FOSFA, which have a two tier regime within the ADR process itself. Uh, also the quality of the tribunal is unmatched. As I mentioned, if uh, you want a neutral third party arbitrator, this is all something an institution, institution can assist you with. So despite these advantages, why is it that Indian parties still do not choose uh, institutional arbitrations and specifically those that are uh, based in India? In, to, uh, in 2017, um, uh, Justice B.N. Sri Krishna actually came out with a report which, is, uh, which actually makes for a great read. He spoke about um, institutions uh, uh, which are prevalent in India and why is it that parties aren't choosing those? So as per his committee report, he mentioned uh, a few topics, which I'll just quickly talk about. One is, of course, the lack of credible arbitral institutions in India. Parties felt that, the, that these institutions in India did not really add any real value. There were several misconceptions around institutional arbitration, the cost and inflexibility and rigidity, then the lack of government support, lack of legislative support, and certain judicial attitudes towards arbitration in general. These are obviously some of the issues uh, which uh, we will have to sort of navigate. Um, so I hope this is just a flavor of everything. Uh, thanks, Chiranji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dasidar, for, for these uh, um, beautifully explained uh, difference between arbitral uh, ad hoc arbitrations and institutional arbitrations and discussing why parties should move from ad hoc arbitration to institutional arbitrations. Um, uh, and, and to also discuss why, what are the reasons why parties today are not choosing Indian arbitration institutions. Um, uh, while it is absolutely true that they are not only not choosing Indian arbitration institutions, but, but they are not choosing institutional arbitration at all in the first place. However, it is observed that Parties which are choosing institutional arbitration are opting for foreign arbitral institutions such as CIAC, ICC, LCIA. In fact, India has been in the top five non-Singapore users of CIAC for a few years now and has been the top non-Singapore users of CIAC arbitration in 2019. Uh, also, the number of parties opting for ICC arbitration has more than tripled from 2018 to 2019, taking India to the second position in terms of overall parties. Therefore, this makes me curious as to what are the reasons of, for parties to not choose Indian arbitration institutions to administer their arbitration. And for this, uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Jalan to share his views. Thank you, Chirinji. A very good evening to everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of this esteemed panel. Uh, Chirinji, you are absolutely right that uh, it's one thing that uh, Indian parties are not going for institutional arbitrations and prefer ad hoc arbitrations. And very li rightly put by Jyoti, uh, it is another issue and a more uh, important issue for the matter of this discussion, that even where we are choosing institutional arbitrations, we are focusing on, you know, what I would call the top five uh, institutions in the world, CAC, HKIC, ICC, uh, so on and so forth. In this mix, Indian parties have uh, either forgotten or uh, do not consider uh, the institutional arbitrations uh, based out of India? Well, uh, according to me, the primary reason actually flows from what Jyoti said. Jyoti very eminently uh, identified and listed out the advantages of an institutional arbitration. And most of these advantages actually come out of the rules that the institutional arbitration has. You know, uh, there are more than 35 uh, institutional arbitrations uh, only in India. And uh, the, the legal perception on, of each is different. Uh, while India is an extremely uh, large country, for the purposes of the market here that we are talking about, that is uh, those clients who are actually interested in uh, looking into institutional arbitrations, A, that themselves is a very low number, and uh, B, for them uh, being lost in the 35 uh, arbitral institutions and the extremely complicated and at times even outdated rules uh, is something they don't want to go into. Uh, the most important aspect uh, that a client looks at when he is uh, deciding or choosing upon an institutional arbitration is that the trust that it would hold uh, 
when the matter actually uh, comes up for arbitration. See, uh, while uh, these uh, clauses are drafted uh, in a boardroom and you know they are contained in the agreement, they actually come of use when the going goes bad. When the going goes bad, both parties or all the parties involved in the dispute are already at ends. And at that time, they are uh, trusting and depending on uh, the legal rules and uh, the enforcement of them and the actual practical application of those rules uh, in the scenario. That I think is uh, why most uh, clients have uh, focused more on a SIAC or an ICC, the two top two examples that Jyoti gave, so we'll stick to that, that uh, what have they done right? Uh, the first and foremost, when you go into a dispute, you want to maintain the clock you want a timely resolution of the dispute. It is important that in India, the perception has always been that while arbitration may be uh, a faster method than uh, the traditional litigation, it is still not uh, time bound. Although the 1996 uh, Act does provide uh, timelines and well, it has been a, a very important leap from the erstwhile uh, regime still maintaining timelines is something that Indian institutional arbitrations is not trusted with. That is uh, some place where I think uh, the more foreign institutional arbitrations have excelled in. Uh, the other thing uh, that I think is very important is uh, keeping up to date with the current scenario. Now, uh, a lot of these institutional arbitrations in India that I've seen, uh, the rules are, uh, you know, eight years old, the rules are 10 years old, sometimes even older. And I've actually come across a couple of places where the rules are archaic. Uh, as a contrast with this, uh, you see SIAC, every couple of years, it comes out with an amendment to its rules and it quickly updates with the, you know, uh, with the requirements that are more prevalent, what it thinks could even uh, benefit uh, the ongoing arbitrations, its experiences uh, from the ongoing arbitrations are actually applied into the rules. And uh, that is something that uh, helps the uh, Indian parties to trust uh, on the institutional arbitrations of more foreign jurisdictions. The third aspect is uh, there is extreme localization of uh, institutional arbitration in India. Uh, for example, you know, it's it's good to have multiple options of India-based institutional arbitrations. I am uh, not for one saying that there should be a monopoly or there should be only one institutional arbitration in India to choose from. It's completely okay to have options. However, when you have uh, 35 of them, it's uh, according to me, uh, a number which is overwhelming and uh, confusing at times. And uh, a lot of, uh, the uh, a lot of the institutional arbitrations in India are also factored out because of this, because of extreme localization. So, for example, a party uh, based out of Delhi, they uh, generally don't understand that you do not need to be uh, based out of Mumbai to, for example, opt for the MCIA. And uh, the although it's called the uh, MCIA, but it is not only for Mumbai or for Maharashtrans who. Uh, have to opt for those rules. I think when it comes to this, uh, some of the international institutional arbitrations have been able to get across uh, uh, and you know have been able to clarify with their segments in various countries. For example, uh, SIAC has an India office and it's uh, extremely uh, helpful to actually engage with the India office to uh, get done with the SIAC arbitration. These are another aspects which I think uh, impacts the perception of people uh, to opt for uh, international institutional arbitrations. Uh, the last aspect that I actually wanted to touch upon uh, is uh, that cost. Cost, clarity of costs is another aspect which, uh, uh, which actually helps uh, clients to decide which institutional arbitration they would go, uh, want to go into the kind of breakup and the kind of uh, clarity that some of these uh, institutional arbitrations give on, uh, uh, on the cost aspect. Indian uh, rules, a lot of them don't actually go into as, as much detail 
of uh, uh, of the cost aspect. And uh, when it comes to disputes, I have seen more often than not clients who like that clarity. There's, that's a comfort which uh, is very near and dear to the clients. Uh, Another aspect, and I think I'll end with this aspect, is the kind of arbitrators. Uh, I'm, I've kept this for the end because I think it's a very important aspect uh, which uh, actually is being considered more and more. Uh, I see the panels which are available with uh, uh, some of these international arbitration centers are, uh, you know, they are extremely technical. They are uh, from... Uh, advocates, from solicitors, from barristers, from all walks of life. They're very experienced uh, people you can choose from as arbitrators. And in India, unfortunately, there is this aspect or there's this notion that the first thing that you opt for when you go for an arbitration in India is let's appoint a retired judge. Uh, well, I'm not saying that uh, there's any uh, fault in doing so. There are a lot of people who profess uh, that view uh, that you should go for retired judges. I, for one, don't agree with that. I, for one, have always believed that uh, retired judges are not right for arbitrations. I am one who uh, keep this in mind and I've uh, again and again advised my clients to not opt for retired judges. More often than not, uh, what happens is the retired judges have for 20, 30 years practiced one style of uh, handling our uh, matter management. And you know, that style comes involuntarily to them. Even when they are handling arbitrations, they sort of try to bend towards that style of uh, matter management in an arbitration, which uh, kind of diverts from the entire objective of an expedited and a more uh, easier and more comfortable way in which arbitration should continue. This, I think, is a very important factor why uh, more and more people want uh, their disputes to be handled internationally or through international institutions. Because uh, I think that uh, you need to walk away from the traditional thoughts in India that a retired judge is a natural choice for an arbitrator. Uh, I think these would be my reasons or my uh, uh, what I think are the perceptions which need to change for Indian uh, arbitral institutes to actually do better and have a larger share of the pie of the arbitrations that today India has seen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jalan. Thank you so much for these insightful views. And uh, you're absolutely right uh, that all these factors that you've mentioned does affect the confidence of parties in choosing uh, an arbitral institution and therefore uh, there is sort of an advantage with the foreign institutional arbitration because they're able to uh, they're able to go through these barriers and create an atmosphere, create an environment which uh, which which offers parties that credibility and that stability that parties are looking for while uh, going for in an arbitration uh, going for in an arbitration. Um, now this makes me wonder if there are other factors, some other significant factors. Uh, uh, which, which uh, sway parties' decision in opting for Indian arbitration institutions to, uh, to administer their dispute. And uh, to, to, uh, to, to discuss these uh, factors, I'd like to invite Mr. Mukherjee. Um, I'd like to invite Mr. Mukherjee. Uh, thank you very much um, for organizing this uh, wonderful session on a very important topic. Uh, uh, Aditya, who spoke before me, placed the nail at the right place and hit it very softly by saying that uh, judges have developed a unique style of matter management. So, well, if I were to call a spade a spade, I would uh, have to say that basically in India, uh, uh, the judicial system works on a very steep hierarchy. It works on the principle that it is a part of the, you know, state, and that it, you know, it does, uh, it does justice to the people and the population. Arbitration does not work on that principle. Arbitration works on flattening the hierarchy. It works on the principle that you are doing a service to the people who have appointed you, and therefore uh, there is nothing wrong with retired judges at all. But I think we need to uh, build capacity domestically 
uh, our institutions need to build capacity domestically on these principles of that govern uh, the uh, the arbitration uh, as a dispute resolution process so one of the things that uh, definitely our institutions lack and therefore must uh, strive to get is uh, more international flavor so uh, i would i would think that as a matter of um, norm some of the institutions who and particularly the more progressive ones should consider appointing presiding arbitrator from an international jurisdiction well versed in common law well versed in, in uh, principles of contract which are similar in india to the common law but they must look to get international uh, presiding arbitrators to come in and you know uh, so that the local domestic arbitrators also get a flavor of what you know happens internationally and there is capacity building the work ethic the speed the quality these are things we have all experienced when we do an international arbitration and it's not so actually i have done a international arbitration in singapore with a purely indian panel and i found the indian judges to have you know be no less but then there are few among uh, in the, in that mold and uh, mostly yeah our judicial system is steeped in the uh, the constitutional jurisdiction and some of these judges that i had the experience of were hardcore commercial judges so they had a you know uh, they had a sense of what, um, how you know commercial matters are to be dealt with so i think uh, a more international flavor is required to be brought in by the institutions um, interesting data i was reading an niti aayog report which said that you know 3% of the 126 arbitrators that were appointed by ciac were indian indians and uh, you know ciac administers predominantly indian um, uh, cases cases of in, uh, that originate in india so we have to recognize that arbitration international arbitration uh, you know so, um, uh, and indian parties have also become sophisticated have you know been part of international arbitrations in various jurisdictions uh as a part of international commerce and you know commerce is becoming more and more global so we while i think in recent times a lot of good effort good work has been done to build the interest the legal principles and align them with the international based practices uh, i don't think we got that same uh, kind of uh, 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 mindset on the procedure so let me explain a bit more on where we may you know uh, lack in terms of procedure one is that as again jyoti said most most of the times our arbitrations just attract the court process and you know and we keep even in in trying to do good like fixing a timeline under section 29a we end up giving the jurisdiction to the court and you know we are back to court and the courts have dockets which are massive because because of you know the population that we have and the few judges that we have in terms of uh, the population uh, even if they they have the best intentions they find it difficult to deal with these questions under section 9 section 11 um uh, uh, section 29 which are a lot of them are you know things which could be dealt with in arbitration process so i think the process must also the courts must start freeing themselves from the arbitration process as much as possible for instance now uh, with the uh, judgment in um, the future group matter of delhi high court they have recognized that emergency arbitration could very much be a part of an arbitration agreement and could be enforced so i would say that you know if the parties have agreed on an emergency arbitration procedure as a part of the international rules section 9 should not be maintainable in a domestic uh, local court similarly in relation to 11 more and more uh, uh, opportunity to be should be given by courts to for institutions to appoint if a court appoints a judge and then ask the institution to monitor the uh the institution's ability to monitor that appointee is much less because he's been appointed by the supreme court now whereas if the institution were to appoint then the institution's moral jurisdiction over that individual would be far greater 
that you know we appointed you so you know you please abide by the requirements that we as an institution have so court, many instances courts appoint arbitrators and then ask this is the institution to which uh, you know i in my opinion is counterproductive so i think the courts should start freeing themselves from the at least the process arbitration Sub, on the substantive law they have done a lot of good work reduce the public policy uh, you know reduce the scope for challenge uh, yeah, that and therefore on the process side they must start also you know looking at it and see how, how they can lay their hands off this process one of the things that we as a country are probably good at, but we don't do enough as a part of the ADR process is mediation, conciliation, etc. Uh, but there is a reason for it, uh, you know, and the reason for it is that um, in commercial arbitration, uh, ultimately one party has to pay. So if he can stretch the timeline for which he has to pay without sufficient consequences on the other side, in terms of costs and interest, uh, he, there is no, there is no, uh, there is no incentive to mediate. So therefore, I think that is the other aspect which the courts must tighten the screws on, and the arbitrators must uh, must look at very seriously is actually awarding actual cost, actual cost to the uh, against the losing party. We just succeeded in a Singapore Court of Appeal where we got one and one point two five crores as cost. So, you know, uh, if I were to advise another client to go for uh, appeal, uh, you know, appeal to Singapore Court of Appeal, I would remember that, that I had received 1.25 crores of cost, which my potential client could end up paying. So I think the imposition of cost on a losing party is something that now, of course, with, uh, with the amendment in um, uh, Section 31, there is, the, there, is, there is a lot of detailing on it. But needs to be very, very seriously in, in, uh, made a part of all arbitrations in India. Just like, you know, for a long time, what plagued our arbitration was this conflict of interest business that the government appointed arbitrators, uh, the government um, MD of the company against whom we had dispute became the arbitrator or his nominee became an arbitrator. Then we got rid of it with the amendment. I think imposition of cost is a very important aspect of any commercial venture. When you start a commercial venture, if you fail, you pay the cost for it. So arbitration, like any other commercial venture, requires to have a downside and actual cost was definitely paid. That will actually lead to, you know, the ADR and other mediation conciliation measures succeeding more. And I think the institutions, when they when they look at, um, you know, administering arbitration, must be put, look at it from both sides. A, try to minimize cost by promoting ADR, ADR measures, and then try to, uh, you know, maximize the penalty of go, going ahead and lose, uh, you know fighting a uh, losing case by imposition of costs. So I think that that is the other aspect that is important. And finally, I think the, you know, domestically, we, when we do all this, we must also match up with the fee schedule of some of the uh, international organizations. If, uh, uh, for instance, you know, uh, our maximum fee under fourth schedule is 30 lakhs. Uh, and whether the claim is uh, 500 crores, then also it is 30 lakhs. So, I mean, it doesn't work where, you know, in Sing uh, uh, SIAC, if it's a 250 crore claim, you will easily have to pay about 1.5 crores as, uh, as arbitrator's fee, another 15 lakhs as administration fee. Um, if it is uh, in MCI also, there are, you know, number of, um, uh, the, the fee schedule is pretty, uh, uh, remunerative but at the same time uh, uh, what what happens is that many of these uh, um, cases that get referred from the high court uh, for appointment there the uh, post schedule often comes into it, uh, play uh, the other thing that we have all experienced over the years as practitioners is this per appearance per hearing fee per sitting fee which makes no sense um, you know uh, i think the at least 50% of the fee should be recoverable only when the award is delivered. That's what the international practices are. So I, I would think that that is also an area where the uh, the legal community, the courts uh, could actually 
improve uh, significantly and you know to make india a uh, uh, arbitration destination like uh, you know uh, like singapore most of our cases go to singapore singapore is just five and a half hours away there is a, you know in, to, in terms of now the courts um, uh, role in interfering with the arbitration process it is less it is only that we place too much responsibility with the court which the court is not able to uh, manage and that's why there is a problem uh, so there is a great opportunity. The costs in Singapore are very high. We are much low cost, low cost jurisdiction. Uh, so there are great opportunities, obviously. But uh, I think uh, in terms of process, we surely need capacity building. I mean, without capacity building, we can't just hope that you know overnight people will recognize us as a great arbitration destination. Just like when I used to work in law firm, and many of us who work in law firms and even uh, you know in corporates, we we learn a lot from engagement with people from different jurisdictions, I think the arbitrators could also uh, significantly gain, gain out that experience. And then, you know, the actual cost and make it a more commercial venture is something that would be important. It's very Thank important. you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for these uh, insightful views. I have two questions uh, for you. One, um, uh, it has been seen that global arbitration institution keeps on continuously promoting their institution till date, even when they are globally recognized, uh, keep, keeping a dedicated team for their promotion and marketing, establishing local offices in different countries, organizing events and participating in various seminars, none of which is seen to be done by Indian arbitration institutions that extensively. Uh, do you think this lack of interaction with the community and letting people know that they exist is a big factor in their inability to attract parties? One, and the second question which I want to ask you is that it has been seen that at, uh, that at the end of the day, lawyers and law firms are the people who would advise clients when drafting arbitration, when, uh, when drafting arbitration agreements. Uh, so do you think uh, 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 some sort of confidence in lawyers and law firms uh, 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 by, by these arbitration institutions would go on uh, in a long way in uh, you know, uh, advising clients to put um, an Indian arbitration institution as a boilerplate uh, agreement in different agreements uh, as a mode to uh, administer their disputes. So I, I I think the the first question and the second question are also linked in some way. And um, uh, basically, uh, as I said, um, arbitration is a commercial venture, um, uh, part of the interna international commerce. So we need to market it just like any other commercial venture uh, goes without saying. And we need to develop, uh, deliver the quality and continuously improve to deliver the quality of service just, just like any other commercial venture does, just like a law firm does, just like a corporate does. Uh, so it must. But um, as I said, the mindset is still, you know, of dispensation of justice from ivory tower. And it is not as, I, I don't think many of us still, you know, look at um, justice dispensation as a service which is done to the community. So therefore, when people charge high, we start saying, oh, how are you charging so high? And you know, <laughs> because it's a public good. The arbitration is not a public good. It's a, and so that we, and therefore, you know, our institutions must come with that uh, fervor of a commercial venture and I, you know the, that question is absolutely linked and if it is a commercial venture why should anybody support them by having clauses in agreements which you know uh, which um, uh, which has uh, these institutions when they don't deserve it maybe the government can like maharashtra government has and it's a good step can look at government contract at least it's a far far better uh, situation than having the md appoint and then the, um, the arbitration being held in one of the cabins or uh, the rooms in the, you know, the public works department. So <laughs> it, is, it is a far better thing and said, so let the government do that. But uh, at least commercial lawyers and law firms are not going to recommend just because you know, there is an institution which is there unless they are able to measure up to the quality which we have come to experience internationally. True. Absolutely, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, now that we have identified some of the important factors due to which Indian parties are not choosing Indian arbitration institutions to administer the disputes, the question that uh, uh, that the question that pops in my head is: 
what is the advantage that india would have if parties start choosing or opting for indian arbitration institutions to administer their disputes and i would like to invite mr nathani to share his views on this uh so you know first of all i'll 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 tell you where my experience come from arbitration you know i mean during the early stages of career uh, this was around 2002 2004 uh, two three examples and uh, there on the experience part of it i had a negotiation with microsoft which was happening and uh, as always we at that time also foreign agreements you have jurisdiction which is out of india uh they had they had i think arbitration panel as icc in singapore and uh, you know if you see that time they used to have an annexure in the agreement which says that if you are based in india x y z other countries uh then your arbitration is at icc singapore if you are in certain jurisdiction then your arbitration is x and y place that was the first trigger point uh the second trigger point which i remember this was late after 2006 uh i was uh, in a conference with uh, justice bandari justice dalvir bandari uh justice dalvir bandari is presently the uh, judge of the international court of justice and uh, he said to one of the senior counsels i will not name it he said stop taking matters because you are delaying arbitration now the laws have come but you have taken so much arbitration that your arbitrations are getting delayed and this was right from the mic towards the first row where the senior counsel was sitting uh number 1 so it was in the lighter sense but uh, number 3 uh in a united kingdom court a commercial court where the appeal went that commercial court judge the first has this lower court taken about 6 months to decide a commercial dispute because if you take 6 months to decide a commercial dispute how will the business function and i was having a hearty laugh because in if you file section 11 at that time in uh, any high court for appointment of an arbitrator your hearing itself will come after 6 months to 1 year just for appointment of an arbitrator all right so arbitration process is yet to begin uh one time we were standing in the court uh, and just in a lighter tone we said yeah the arbitration is begin but arbitration is presently uh, there's some noise coming somewhere uh we were standing on the court and on the lighter side what we said is that arbitration is become like an airline which has a take off time but does not have a landing time you know so these are the four experience i come from now if india wants to become a very competitive jurisdiction all right it has all the intellectual uh, capacity to do that uh, we had the law since two th- uh, 1996 uh, it's high time i i still remember i think many of the sentences which probably everyone would have said i worked in a corporate and my problem was that i need to book a taj hotel i need to book a conference room i need to have best of the facilities cars etc you know those things have been a cost has been always uh, triggered down and that has really affected the reputation of arbitration so the key point number 1 is about the reputation of arbitration now today whenever i speak about arbitration the first thing which comes to the mind if it's a big arbitration the first thing and and i can give you several examples having worked with all the big corporates uh, we had some big dispute that was in reliance ekta kapoor then raymond singhana family dispute was all in the newspapers uh, uh, i do remember the instances which came up to the mind while we were discussing these options all right i get a call from a hotel 15 uh, 17 five star hotel in uh, south mumbai saying that you have appointed x person as an arbitrator and you have booked a room but normally uh, that arbitrator was an ex judge and they said normally he prefers to stay in this particular room all right which was a level 1 above the room which i was booking so you know that has really tinted the reputation of arbitration i think we need to put the arbitration reputation in place number 1 now 
I am presently seeing India going way above those particular parts. We all know that this is the cause of uh, this is the root cause of the problems which are there. So while I go towards the root cause, what is the advantage India will have? All right. Now, as a country, we have been now promoting India as an arbitration hub. We have these arbitration panels, which have uh, institutions which have come up. The changes were brought in the arbitration law itself in 2015, the amendment. The aim was to achieve that speedy and efficacious disposal of the matter. All right. So these are one of the two contentious issue. One is the speedness of the issue and one is the efficacy. Now, when you say efficacy, you put down on the costing efficiency as well as the arbitral, arbitral efficiency in that. Now, since 2014, after the new government came in, it has been a priority for the policymakers to make India as a better investment uh, opportunity, as well as to have a hassle-free trade mechanism. All right, It's not only about arbitration, even at all levels, digitization happened, etc. So that's our goal that we want to have, uh, we have want to have India as a business friendly jurisdiction. At the same time, in India, lawmakers are also focusing to provide better provisions of enforcing contracts and quick and easy means of resolution of dispute. Uh, India has progressed towards improving its global perception of doing business uh, in India. Uh, according to the World Bank rating also on the ease of doing business in 2018, uh, India ranked about 100 out of 190 countries, uh, which is a great sign for the Indian uh, government as well as the administration part of it. Uh, in 2016-17, India was also among the top 10 economies which has been improving and reducing complexities about their regulatory processes. So there is something to celebrate while we are working on it. Uh, arbitration became one of the celebrated dispute resolution mechanism because of the factors that when the Indian law came into force, we said there is a flexibility and a unique process, which means you don't have that civil procedure code evidence and you don't go, to, go into the zone of two years, five years and 10 years. There's a unique neck to the process and we wanted to materialize that uniqueness. In the process, when the law came in, the distinction happened between ad hoc arbitration as well as institutional arbitration. Now, perception wise, what happened is that like uh, speakers were saying that you appoint a retired judge or you, retire, uh, or you appoint any arbitrator, uh, ad hoc arbitration looked was became a perceivedness that it's not a very reliable because there might be some gaps in it it may turn out to be very expensive uh, at one point of time there was a concept of ca caucus which is still there where you sit down with the parties and while the arbitrator is discussing with the other party you as a lawyer will see your watch because the billing is by the hour all right now, what distinction happened in institutional arbitration? The institutional arbitration gradually ramped up their reputation. Uh, if you remember in last 15, 20 years, the, the institutions which was very well known abroad was International Chamber of Commerce, ICC. Dubai came out with a package saying that, all right, your air tickets to hotel, to arbitration, to everything will be taken care. Dubai International Center for Arbitration came up. Uh, AAA, American arbitration was very expensive. People would not prefer. AAA was basically at one point of time suffering the same situation what we are suffering in ad hoc arbitration. Then came up your CAC, Singapore International Arbitration Center. Now, because of this reputational, like somebody was saying here, that you know they've put in a lot of efforts to put an office there, marketing, you receive emails, Singapore International Arbitration recently set up an office in New York. What happened is that because of this professional marketing as well as the approach and the rules which they had, and some of the good cases were there. In fact, SIAC is not well known right now also when the Future Group and Reliance Group dispute came up. SIAC was also well known when the Tata and Docomo dispute came up because of the telecom issue. Now, they, they gradually turned out to be perceived as more reliable, predictable, and acceptance. 
this is the three criteria we are also looking if india wants to have a jurisdiction friendly or a friendly jurisdiction for arbitration uh, we need to create that trust reliability predictability and acceptance now how do we do that number one first is that we create the reputation inbuilt reputation that is it's an efficient system whether you consider ad hoc whether you consider institutional you develop those systems in a manner that your arbitration awards are completed law provides you a provision of one year two year etc and then parties can extend or something but point is that suppose if you have an arbitration award which is passed in 6 months 8 months 12 months it will make a lot of difference to it so number one we need to gain reputation on those grounds number two enforcement of those awards what is the one up position which singapore arbitration center got in india is that the legislature never contemplated emergency arbitration in fact the law commission report rejected emergency arbitration singapore international arbitration passed an emergency arbitrator award restraining reliance and future group from proceeding with the deal the award got challenged in the delhi high court delhi high court did not give a stay on that so there is an enforcement advantage to it number 3 your arbitration rules really make a difference so those arbitration rules which are published in the booklet uh, the user friendly uh, uh, rules which are there for example you can also exchange your uh, statements of claim uh, by an email you can correspond in many regards so those are some rules uh, which are available which are user friendly rules uh, we have institutions like ciac icc uh, dubai international arbitration hong kong arbitration etc these are reputed because of these factors number 4 your administration itself is very important the advantage of institutional arbitration when you set up as a when you want to look upon india as a arbitration friendly jurisdiction the administration of those institutions is also very important you have trained staff to administer those arbitration uh, they will ensure that the arbitral tribunal is appointed immediately upon uh, the request been received uh, advance payments of the fees and expenses are received time limits are kept in mind it's not an open door policy uh, the arbitration is run as smoothly as possible these are various factors which go on to build your uh, uh, your reputation as a arbitration friendly jurisdiction uh, for india the fifth important part is that when we have a arbitration friendly jurisdiction there is a supervision provision what is a supervision provision uh, we remembered at the time 20 years back when any icc award is passed there is a scrutiny of that award before it is passed on to the parties there is a board which is sitting there in confidence to look that whether the arbitration award which has been decided by the arbitrator or arbitrators against one party or in favor of one party has it covered every angle is there a lapse in that is there any gaps in that etc those scrutiny happens and therefore if you see all these awards of the institutional arbitrations these orders are very reputed by themselves because they have been cross checked in addition to the arbitrator who is sitting there on the seat to decide the matter number 6 as we all pointed out we always speak out in this heavy words saying the quality of the arbitral panel all right uh i would not use the word quality of arbitral panel and one once we were having a debate also uh, where ma- our moderator pointed out today that you don't require judges uh you know we were debating out that oh, what is this trend uh, why the present judge is appointing a retired judge those discussions do came up uh the two reasoning which was given for that is that number one is that the judges have a trust in the fellow judge number two is that those judges have dealt with all these matters so well for so long in the courts uh, that they understand that you know how this matter will be finally decided all right so this was uh, the argument in favor the argument against it was that 
that if the matter is about engineering or any speciality or about internet or e-commerce do you require a arbitrator who should be an expert on that do you require a technical person or do you require a generational lawyer who will be able to understand what is an hyperlink and what are the synonyms which are used in this business all right what i really feel about the quality of the arbitral panel is that that we have all these uh, all these learned arbitrators who should be trained enough in the arbitration like for example when i speak about myself i'm a trained mediator i've been trained by trainers who have gone from one of the best institutions in mediations in london and they've trained me so when i sit for mediation i i know that it is about the reality check and therefore my first goal is to listen to the parties so i always feel irrespective of the position of the person the person should be trained enough to handle the matter it's not the past experience of sitting on the bench you should be a trained arbitrator in the matter you should be a trained mediator or a conciliator in the matter that's the pre qualification for it number 1 number 2 if the matter is about construction maritime contract trade commodities internet e-commerce we should when the time requires have an expert appointed uh, for that particular panel all right this is the, these are the two critical observations i have seen where matters are then debated before the appeal court saying that you know there is a there is a lapse in the award because the engineering factor has not been taken into consideration no judge no lawyer or arbitrator unless he is an engineer is expected to know the answer from that angle all right so one is the panel should be a trained educated uh, in arbitration panel they should be certified irrespective of the position the person is in and number 2 when you require an expert we should have that expert in place we should not have an ego issue against the other person being advising me uh, on that arbitration panel the seventh is about the remuneration part so earlier we used to say the charges are very high the cost is very high and then we found a diplomatic language of saying that the remuneration is too high all right remuneration has always remained a factor uh Uh, whenever you go for an arbitration you look at the cost and benefit of it uh if you think that this foreign institutional arbitration is cheap it may not be as cheap considering the amount which is involved but if you are a big oil company those amounts don't matters to you but what is a reasonability is always a question which i have seen but the perception what people have for indian institution is that that the cost is very high we have to remove those perceptions somehow all right uh, because sine councils do charge arbitrators do charge keeping the indian factor in mind we'll have to come out with a some bridging part of it because arbitration success has not happened because there is a lot of amount of cost irrespective of the five star treatment which is expected uh, i think somewhere down the line we'll have to bridge that gap that gap has still remained open for last 15 years uh number 8 two more to go number 8 is about the speed there are a lot of arbitrations which i have seen i am just speaking out of my experience and i will always speak out of my mind there are some arbitrations which can be completed between 3 to 6 months unfortunately i have seen some arbitrations being continued even in that case for more than a year two year etc now we have a threshold so we try to finish in that threshold or we take 6 months extension because that's mutually granted next 6 months we are little sticky about it because we think that the high court may uh, put a ruler on our knuckle but point is that somewhere down the line people have to think about timelines uh we should not only think from one side where there is a where there is a forum of lawyers and arbitrators we should think on the other side from a business standpoint also i feel in a guesstimate time we should have arbitrations which should get completed between 6 to 9 months i think we should not enlarge it even normal arbitrations are really taking time and that's very questionable because then again we come back to the remuneration part where parties feel 
that you know the because of the cost involved the arbitration was little dragged on uh the ninth part is that there are some great default processes in the rules of the institutions which are available uh where if the party doesn't appear upon being called upon uh the tribunal proceeds for hearing uh in case of siac emergency arbitration matter was in the limelight uh there were two arguments put by future group number one it says that emergency arbitrator was never conceived by the legislator and therefore this order uh, should not be upheld the stay was not granted uh full fledged arbitration ha- arbitrator arbitration has been initiated now all arbitrators have been appointed and second the delhi high court reflected on the fdi rules uh may have been probably breached uh but point is that there are some great procedures which are required in our arbitration process why not do why not do we feel that we should not have an emergency arbitration uh, arbitrator award i'll give you one of the finest examples uh there are two cases which are there bank guarantee law is very clear that even if you have performed all your contract the opposite party can still encash your bank guarantee you will have to go to the court get an arbitrator appointed and then recover the money all right number 2 there is a lock in period in an agreement for 7 years the party has breached the contract the lawyer has advised them that even if you breach there is no stay order which will be granted by the high court we will see in the arbitration and what happens after 2 years if there was a provision for emergency arbitrator i think things would have looked uh, differently so maybe from a justice point of view uh, i would have preferred that there is some provision which is available for emergency arbitrator because the law if you see today the courts have been very diligent and they have refrained themselves from interfering with the arbitration unless there is a patent illegality or a public policy matter uh and i think this step would have been useful at that point of time uh so in my closing remark which is my 10th point uh is india has all the capabilities to provide a perfect destination uh for institutional arbitration considering the intellectual power uh rules administration supervision quality of arbitrators uh remuneration cost uh and speed we only need to portray these capabilities into a jurisdiction which has a reputation uh, in arbitration uh, and i think that's very important because it's a 96 uh, law we are already in 2021 it's about 25 years uh, i think it's high time uh, that we become more efficient in our efforts uh, that's from my side thank you very much you are on mute chiranjeev chiranjeev you are on mute please unmute your uh... hello thank you mr natani um for these views and i absolutely agree with you that to attract parties to indian arbitration institution and to make in uh, make india an arbitration hub uh, there will have to be concert like there will have to be collective efforts made by all the stakeholders including government including legislatures judiciary arbitration institutions themselves uh, lawyers everybody and uh, once we start uh, changing our perception and changing our approach towards arbitration we will definitely make uh, we will definitely walk in the right direction to make india an arbitration hub now uh, this brings me to my last question uh which is what are the what are the factors what what would it take to make india an arbitration hub what are your suggestions uh to uh, which, which should be implemented um, with an immediate effect to to promote uh, indian arbitration institutions and to promote india as an arbitration hub uh and and i'd like to invite um everyone uh, to to share their suggestions uh, starting with uh, ms dastidar hi thank you um so two really quick points uh one is that uh if uh, touching upon really what zameer was also talking about if if uh, the institutions 
that administer arbitration in India, if they can provide credible case management uh, systems, if they can pro uh, have credible uh, case management services, which, uh, which, which will include um, not just ramping up facilities and something which goes beyond, uh, you know, clerical or secretarial assistance, they need to uh, see which of the issues uh, can be bifurcated into an award to be given initially, which of the issues can be decided, uh, you know, by the mutual cooperation of parties, which issues, um, uh, you know, will require oral evidence, which needs uh, documentary evidence. So, a real, you know, a credible system has to be in place. And my second point, which is really touching upon what Sitesh also said a little earlier about the role of the executive, the government. Yes, we've seen in Maharashtra there's a boilerplate template for institutional arbitration, so on. But I think if this can be done, not just uh, uh, it should be done also for PSUs. It should be done for any sort of state instrumentality. There's a lot of, uh, say, oil and gas arbitration. So that should be a boilerplate template uh, so as to encourage uh, Indian institutional arbitration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dasidhan. Uh, Mr. Jalan. Yes, uh, I think uh, another aspect which I think uh, Sitesh uh, touched on um, was that you need to accept that a dispute resolution by way of arbitration and institutional arbitration more so is a service. The, uh, the professionalism aspect of that service, the, uh, the aspect that the end goal is a timely resolution of the dispute and the aspect that at the end of the day, if uh, amounts are being spent by both parties, whether it be towards the facilities, whether it be towards the arbitrator fees or towards the institution fees or towards the lawyers, is actually towards the end. That is, uh, there is a uh, resolution and when that resolution occurs, that's when uh, a bulk of those fees should be accepted. This will, I think, at least motivate the arbitrators, the institutions to actually expedite the uh, the resolution process. And once this attitude or, or this service oriented uh, aspect of uh, commercial dispute resolution will become more amenable and acceptable in the country, I think uh, the institutional arbitrations in the country will uh, by themselves to some extent uh, start seeing uh, the light of day more and more. In addition to that, I think uh, effective professional marketing is another aspect which plays uh, a, a very important role uh, well, I understand the limitations of marketing in our industry, but even with those limitations, there have been a lot of uh, institutes who've uh, successfully carried it out. There's no reason uh, that domestically we cannot uh, do the same or the Indian institutions cannot do the same. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Jalan. Uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Mukherjee. Going a bit more granular, I think uh, touched upon quite a few things and uh, so have my co-panelists in great detail. It's been a very enlightening conversation. I think a little more granular, um, uh, the physic, apart from the case management um, uh, system, which is important, or maybe as a part of it, um, I think the physical infrastructure, one of the delightful things in arbitra uh, arbitrating in SIAC in the early days was that you know you didn't have to quarrel with the judge and the witness as to what she was saying, where he or she was saying because you know the transcription service was online and on the screen. So uh, so this is something that will be a uh, you know a very very um, significant uh, service that the institutions could provide uh, as a part of that um, uh, the infrastructure. I think the broad basing of the people who do arbitration is very important. I can't complain as MCI has appointed me in this very second case as an arbitrator. But I think they should broad base the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the pool of arbitrators by including local practitioners, by including international practitioners. So what would happen is when we sit in panels with international practitioners, 
they will carry the performance of some of us back home and then SIAC, they'll share it with international institutions. So people who, you know, who um, come in contact will probably get a chance to be in international panels. So th that will international, uh, you know, basically be a great exposure for the local arbitration community. And uh, I think thirdly, uh, very important, uh, like we have specialist tribunals for many things. I'm not advocating a specialist tribunal, but I think we should have very specialist arbitration, arbitration courts earmarked at all levels, including from district court to civil court where you know they only take up arbitration matters so that you know we are able to uh, deal some of these things will have to be dealt with by the courts only nobody can substitute even if we take out a large part of the process uh, but you know they they need they will be able to deal with it quickly without being contaminated by the massive uh, docket we have in various um, you know other types of cases thank you so much mr mukherjee uh, i'd like to invite mr nathani yeah, so from my experience, I will just point out four. Uh, number one is the cost, which has always remained a contentious issue. Somewhere down the line, we'll have to bridge the gap. Uh, number two is about the speed uh, of the system. Uh, I think wherever possible, we should increase the speed. People are looking forward to it uh, because you are an arbitrator, because you are an institute, uh, probably doesn't happen much in the institutional part because it's an ad hoc uh, arbitration which is happening. People don't express to it, but there is a frustration because I come from that corporate experience of 18, 20 years, where when I sit down with my CEO, uh, he will tell me uh, there's a cost, it's going on for the last two years. Uh, it's a little embarrassing that, you know, some small dispute also takes so much time. Uh, point is that my reasoning is that it would have taken more time in court uh, but that's not a great answer for uh, as a fraternity. Uh, I think I, I'll expect more speed on that. Number three, number three is the efficiency and efficacy in the management of arbitration. These are all critical observations for last 18 years of experience. And number four, uh, which is a bold statement I want to make, uh, we should have compulsory arbitration and we can keep a threshold to it. But I think somewhere down the line, we should start. Right. That's from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for these insightful suggestions. And I'm sure by taking these steps as suggested, we will definitely move towards the goal of making India and global arbitration hub. Um, now with this, we have come to an end uh, for today's discussion. And I'd like to quickly conclude the session. Uh, and I'd like to sum it up this way. Uh, undoubtedly, there has been a sea change in the way arbitration is viewed today. And later, Chiranjeev, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Chiranjeev Akshay sure, from sure. Lex Fitness. We have a few questions in the Q&A box. Uh, you know, I'll request uh, uh, Zameen sure, sir actually, if you can I take sorry, up the questions. I, I would have taken it post this. Uh, all right. Okay, sure, please. I'm sorry, but I misunderstood can, you. But we can definitely uh, take the question and answers before uh, the conclusion. Yes, please. Uh, so uh, there are we will only be able to take three questions uh, for today. Uh, the first question is that if an award of 2016 has been objected to by both parties under Section 34 at their respective district courts, which would which have not been able to dispose of the petitions even after uh, even after over four years, can the suffering uh, supplier seek setting aside by agreeing to the buyer's payer under Section 34? and thus be free to initiate fresh process for re-arbitration without any limitation problem. And uh, I mean, uh, I, 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 you know, anybody could um, uh, answer uh, this question, whoever feels like. Can I please request- uh, uh, So you want to answer this? I said, I mean, one of the law firm partners can take that. Yeah. Uh, you can send the invoice to Chiranjeev. <laughs> so I'll take it. Uh, uh, yeah. So the thing is, uh, theoretically, can you uh, do away with an arbitration award? Both uh, have uh, both have already challenged it. It's been pending for a very long time. The practical answer is, uh, you're not going to get any closer by reinitiating the arbitration proceedings. Uh, if you are uh, actually reinitiating the arbitration proceedings, whatever reasons you travel, you are actually cancelling even that and going back to day zero. So uh, I don't think it is an effective way of actually coming at a resolution. Your uh, 
turning back time and uh, after say 18 months of the arbitration again happening if you again land up before the district courts in 34 you are again going to wait for another four years anyways uh, so i think uh, there are uh, you would rather go for procedures you may file uh, applications or uh applications to expedite the 34 process uh, to uh, to try and uh, instigate the courts to uh, or impress upon the courts as to why uh, they want to or should hear the 34 application and dispose it off uh, that according to me would be a, at least my suggested approach uh, and uh, even district courts although i understand that the uh, district courts do not realize uh, the uh, timeliness of an arbitration proceedings as much as possibly Uh, the high courts do but if impressed upon uh, the district courts would realize and possibly take up the matter uh, uh, to resolve the delay that is being caused thank you thank you uh, mr jalan um, the next question is for um, ms dastadar the question is uh, you have discussed the distinction between ad hoc and institutional arbitration and how institutional arbitration have an edge over ad hoc but on the other side this added advantage comes with some exorbitant cost uh, thus despite being better parties are constrained to go for ad hoc arbitration just to reduce the cost therefore the question is how do you suggest the parties to go for institutional arbitration in such cases or what do you suggest um okay um so i'll try and uh, answer it uh we i think all four of us all four of the panelists have spoken about uh, institutional arbitrations and uh, of course it has an edge over ad hoc in india you know it hasn't really taken off because parties have the impression one of uh, that uh, the institutional arbitration is rigid uh, parties will not have any say over the timelines costs are prohibitive because uh, the impression was always that uh, an institutional arbitration will have to be seated abroad that is not the case i mean we've done multiple institutional arbitrations even if it is administered by lcia or uh, you know ciac we've had them very much uh, you know in india so the fear of having to carry a truckload of people all the way to singapore or london none of that exists plus today you know with the pandemic everybody's moved towards a virtual sort of hearing of matters when you when you will get excellent uh, administration when there's excellent uh, case management services being given whether in india or abroad why is it that you would uh, go in for an ad hoc arbitration i think uh, the benefits uh, of institutional institutions uh, administering uh, arbitrations far outweigh or uh, ad hoc in fact at the moment you know without saying more i know i'm doing an arbitration which has gone on for 3 years it is a massive matter but i really wish it was an institutional arbitration uh by now you know uh, the matter would have been over and i think both parties uh, are left uh, high and dry because uh, it needs supervision and that is something you can't uh, approach the tribunal itself it needs supervision at all sort of levels so i would really recommend an institutional arbitration just on that experience yeah. just on that experience after do a finishing an international commercial arbitration on the ciac i got a domestic arbitration on which we had to negotiate fees so people were negotiating on a per appearance fee i very politely told the panel that um, you may charge ciac fees no problem take but please follow the same uh, you know, disbursement schedule as ciac which is at the end of the award please take most of the money <laughs> so no, i i i just want to add here see if you see the three criteria which i spoke fourth was compulsory arbitration uh, suggestion the three criteria were cost number 2 is uh, your speed and third is your case management if you see ad hoc and institution arbitration the difference you will find if you debate it out they will say the case management is very efficient number 2 speed factor also you will get a check mark because there there is an efficiency attached to it if you see both sides on ad hoc arbitration you always complain that you know it has taken much longer than we expected uh and the case management efficacy of course because there is an individual uh, administration which is there so these two criteria are there and the third criteria is about the cost 
if you are able to achieve this particular three criteria which is appreciated you will achieve your success as a arbitration friendly jurisdiction this is where we are lacking and that's where the distinction between ad hoc and institution and institution has gained two up because of this factor that's that's very candid statement from my side thank you thank you all uh, due to paucity of time we are not going to take any more questions uh, i'll uh, sum the entire debate quickly and then uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, have to end the uh, call uh, so to sum it up undoubtedly there has been a sea change in the way arbitration is viewed today and uh, lately the steps that are being taken are definitely the steps in the right direction however there is still a lot of work to be done as discussed by our panelist and um, to to make uh, india an arbitration hub like singapore or london and therefore it needs to be borne in mind that uh, you you don't become an arbitration hub overnight you would uh, take you will you will take uh, uh, the uh, the time um, that is needed uh, what is important is to focus on what you can do and the catalyst of which will be a combination of government initiatives judicial and legislative support Uh, a proactive arbitration institutions and a conducive commercial mindset as discussed basically the environment that is uh, th that that attracts parties is 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 one where there is a sense of uh, there, there is a sense of certainty predictability and stability and therefore once you start following this recipe and get all the ingredients right this will send out the right message to all the stakeholders and i'm certain that a robust institutional framework will follow uh with this i would like to uh, thank all the panelists for their um, insightful suggestions and for their time um it was a pleasure listening to you all and i can safely say on behalf of our audience as well that we thoroughly enjoyed it i would also like to thank uh, society for corporate legal experts and lex witness for organizing this event and um a big thank to aditi to making uh, to to coordinating with everybody and making this happen thank you so much Thank you, Lex Witness, and thank you, Aditi, and everyone. Thank you. Thank everyone. you so much. You I you. personally thank, thank Chiranjeev for keeping the entire session so interactive, and all the panelists for being a part of it and sharing and imparting your knowledge. Thank you so much, and thank you, Lex. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.